I got in the habit um, of waking up as he often did for most of his working life at 5 a.m. Um, and just, I started reading poems <clears throat> and uh, sort of in the dark, I just started having conversations with these other poets, many of whom uh, also found uh, ways to, to deal with loss and grief through language. Um, one of those poets is here tonight, Jonathan Johnson. Uh, great book, The Desk on the Sea, about his own mother. So, um, you know, I started sort of listening to something that I always kind of encourage my own students to do, which there's a poem by Raymond Carver called Sunday Night that begins, make use of the things around you. And the poem ends, put it all in. And the thing that I was waking up to every morning in the 5 a.m. dark was um, the, the sense in this sentence that um, my father you know, is in a house across the river dying. Uh, or some iteration of that sentence. Um, and so I just was like, I kind of took myself up on my own dare to my own students and said, you know, put your, put your mouth uh, or put your money where your mouth is. Is that the saying? Um, and, you know, start making use uh, of what you're uh, seeing and hearing and experiencing as you're watching uh, your father experience what he's seeing and hearing and maybe even feeling. Um, so, you know, these poems just sort of started naturally coming out of my body in this way. Um, and I couldn't stop them, you know, and I was, um, hundreds of these poems started coming. And uh, that's when I was sending poems to my buddy Russ and saying, are these even poems? You know, like, what, what do you think of these? And uh, like you said, Martin, you know, it's always great to have somebody encouraging you early on. Um, and he certainly was one of, of several uh, friends and, and poets that I look up to uh, who was saying, yeah, keep writing these, these are, these are poems. And uh, one thing Russ even said at one point was, um, this is the book you've been waiting your whole life to write. And I think he's true, or there's something true about that. So um, I'll apologize for the, the heaviness of, of tonight's reading. You could see I'm already sort of struggling. Um, and who knows, I might not even be able to really read as long as you might want me to tonight, or maybe I'll, I'll grab a book of my fiction and, and read something pretty. Uh, from there. Uh, but I'm going to do my best and we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Um, so uh, let's just begin. Now I, I'm just going to begin with the very first poem uh, in the book, uh, which is a poem called What My Father Did Not Have to Say. In his final days, my father did not speak because he could not speak. He did not ask how the car was running or about the kids or his grand dog. He did not ask about work. He did not look out at the boats on the river to say, there goes a 32 footer or the lines on that boat are really fine. He did not say the water was at its highest in 25 years. If his thin lips moved at all, it was only when I wiped them with a wet washcloth or put yogurt on a spoon up to them, hoping he would eat. He did not eat and he did not speak and soon his breathing slowed until there was nothing. He'd been slowly dying and now he was dead. I did not know what to say and so I said little out loud. I walked down to the river where I thought maybe I would find something there to tell me what I was supposed to do now. The loon sat on the water and dove under when a boat motored close by. 
they did not sing, not right then at least. Only later at night did they call out to each other, their voices crisscrossing the river in the April dark. In the moments after my father died, I lathered up his face with soap to shave him. It was the very least that I could do after everything he had always done for us. My mother praised my tenderness, how close I was able to get under his nose and neck, those places where when he was alive, he would pull his face away and tell me to stop. Afterwards, I went down to the river to draw a glass of water from the river we both loved. I dipped my hands into the water to anoint him in the name of the father and the fish. On his head, his hands, his feet, his belly, upon his heart, I made the sign of the cross, followed by a fish, next a crescent moon. I raised the glass of water, which sparkled. It was so clear and so clean, as was my father, as was the clarity that death brings. One thing my father always talked about when he was in the hospital is he sort of used to make light of the fact that uh, the doctors really didn't know half the time what they were doing. So this is a poem called Practice. How cruel that for the last years of his life he could not speak, could not get out of bed to walk himself to the bathroom, could not wipe his face clean, could not shave or shower or brush his teeth without the help of his wife or son. And let's not speak about the plastic bag fixed to the side of his bed or the rubber hose that ran to it, draining out what was in his bladder. The indignity of such reduction, the body as a vehicle of betrayal. This for a man who for 60 years rarely took even an aspirin, who never complained, never missed a single day of work. The doctors were only human and of little help. When he could speak, he often made the joke about the medical profession. That's why they call it practice. They never got it right. In the end, cause of death, malnutrition. He starved himself to death. The one thing he had control of. He turned his head away from the window with a view of his beloved river and went to sleep. Died on a Sunday, a beautiful sunny day, blue skies, loons on the river, the river water that his son anointed his body with clear enough to drink, the way it glistened in the glass everybody amazed at how clean it was, how transparent. That's true. And all these poems are, are true. Uh, but I remember going down to the river and taking a glass and filling it up with what we might think of or especially what folks in the UP might think of when you think of the Detroit River as being kind of a dirty river. You know, I like to refer to it as a muddy river and that water looked clean and clear enough to, to drink, to do anything that you would want to. It was holy water, maybe because uh, to me and to my father too, it certainly was. Look at those birds. Whatever words my father might speak now that he is dead are obvious ones. Look at those birds, he tells me, when the ten swans beat their wings over my head on their way to somewhere else. Even if it's just the other side of the river, 
where there isn't so much ice. Pay attention, he says, when just before dark, the doe and her two fawns cross the road, stopping briefly to look at me as if to say, we see you, we know you live here too. When I go down to the river, when I walk through the trees, when I look at the sky, father, 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 bird, bird, bird. This is a small poem called, This is, There is Singing. <clears throat> the bird outside the window is made of ash. There's no going home. You are already there, sheltered from the wind. Somewhere there is singing. Elsewhere there is a song. Last song. When the priest came to the house to read my father his last rites, he sang like I imagine a bird might sing when it too is singing about death. A nest in a storm blown from a tree, eggs on the ground broken. Afterwards, I walked down to the river to see what I might find there. It was as if nothing had changed. The buoys were anchored in their places to mark where the water dropped off deep. The steel mill kept its silence. I wanted to dive in head first to see what my body would do with the cold, how my heart would be made to race, what would happen if I stopped swimming, how long it would take before I was carried away by the current, my skin turning numb and blue. I wish I had some witty anecdotes, but I don't. <laughs> Who walks in the rain walks on water. Listen, I am a river that holds more fish than I know what to do with. At night, the moon lightens what is otherwise dark. A boat anchored off the tip of an island. A few others adrift, most at the dock or in hoists until morning in the rain, the houses with their porch lights on, burning, some making a hissing sound, moths circling as if being summoned home. At dawn, a man and his dog on a walk, a stone offers itself up from the mud. He picks it up to skip it, watches it sink, thinks to himself, when I was a boy, the things he could do with a rock, a river, those days when he could see bottom. Skin of river and bone. This is not a river to wade out in. It is not a river to cross. The bottom to begin with is made of mostly mud. It is not uncommon to sink down in up to your knees, not a feeling you want to know, unless you have to fix a dock beam damaged by the breakup of ice. My father was the one who always took care of what was broken until he could no longer and handed that hammer down to me. His hands were big knuckled and calloused when I was a boy. It wasn't until I saw them near the end clutching the bed sheet did I realize how small they'd become, how big mine had gotten, how I had to learn to hammer nails into wood, my own flesh tearing. work song. When a thing stops working, take a hammer to it. If the hammer doesn't do the job, 
get a bigger hammer. Hammer hard. This is how the gods get shit done. This is how they break us down and keep us working. My dad loved cars. Um, he's got a very sweet um, Lincoln Town car, 1989 Lincoln Town car that he really prized that as a possession and it's still in my mother's garage. So this is a poem about that. Under the hood of my father's 89 Lincoln Town car. And it's got about 30,000 miles on it or something crazy like that. The battery is dead. At least it's easy to replace. Even I can do that, and I do. The engine turns over smooth, charged by what is brand new. I let it idle. You could even say it purrs. I let the old gas run through. My father would be proud. He taught his boy well, or at least good enough, even though I always resisted those nights with us leaning hunchbacked under the hood, the glow of a single bare light bulb hanging between us, our shadows stretched across the walls of the garage. His own heart kept on in spite of what else around it was breaking down legs that no longer walked, feet that could not hold him up. Time for new tires, the mechanic might say. The nurses showed us how to situate the pillows to keep his feet raised. You don't want his heels to blister. We did what we could when we could, which was always not enough. In the end, for my mother, the open sores on his hips were the worst part of watching him die. He let us go back to our other lives before we could take him for one last drive around the island to see the river's other side. Now I ride alone, or sometimes with my son, who says, we need to get new rims for this bad boy. But for now, I leave it as it is, low miles, white walls facing out. How's everyone doing out there? I'm doing all right. <clears throat> I don't know if I established this or not, but my, my parents um, live on an island called Grosil. It's an island in the middle of the Detroit River. Um, and there's two bridges that connect uh, where I live in Trenton to Grosil. Um, right now, one of those bridges is not uh, functioning because of time and uh, what a river can do to a a steel bridge. Um, so there's mention of this, this bridge in this poem, which I think I can get through this one. We did not know the difference. When I crossed the bridge, I always head south along the river before circling back north to go see my mother. When my father was alive, I turn immediately north, the quickest way the fastest path into an emergency. Even when he was safe in bed and not fallen onto the floor, I drive fast to ward off that possibility. On a good day, he'd take my hand and shake it and sometimes bring it up to his lips. Why talk about the bad days, the times he'd grit his teeth and tell me to get away or worse, when he'd beg me to take him with me. Or the nights he'd look at me as I was leaving and say with his eyes, stay. 
I struggle to sit for more than a few minutes on the couch beside his bed. There were things that needed to get done in this house on the river with my father dying inside it. Light bulbs to change, dishes to wash, the garbage that needed to be taken out, dead batteries in my father's old cars, tires in need of air. I busied myself with the things my father used to do. I tinkered with the boats, the outboard engine, oiled the gears on the dock, tightened nuts and bolts and screws. I wasn't good at doing such things, but someone had to do it or go through the motions at least. Truth be told, I went down to the river to get away. I'd look out across the moving waters at what I could not touch, the red and green buoys that mark the channel, the steel mill shipwrecked on the river's other side. I'd gaze down to see if I might spot a pike cruising lazily through the shallows. If the light was right, I might see one knifing its long narrow body through the light green murk. Sometimes only a few minutes would pass, though turning back to face the house, it was as if years had moved beyond us. I was no longer a young man. My father was still dying. Night had settled in around us. Everything was suddenly so still and so quiet, it was as if we were all of us already dead. One thing that I really um, learned to really appreciate uh, watching my father go through what he was going through is when he lost his ability to walk. And then just walking was like a miracle, you know, like I was like, okay, well, you can still walk, buddy. Like, let's walk, you know. So I, I started really walking a lot. Um, so... This is a, a walking poem. On my morning walk, I question what I see. All that I saw today along the road, I asked if it was my father. Each tree leaning over me, each leaf, every stone I towed with my boot, branches broken off in the night's hard rain, even the clouds and birds flying beneath them. Are you my father? Is this what you have become? Whatever it was, it was an honor, call it a privilege. Even the worst of it, I want to hold on to. Nights when my father would try to bite my hand, when he would tell me to get the fuck out, his bed and his body in the bed covered in shit. Not because to say at least he was alive. He was better off dead than to have to live like this. But to come this close to whatever, to whatever this was, it was an honor, call it a privilege, not for my father, not for my mother who carried the weight of it. I got to see what it is like to look down from above. The gods in the end do little no hands called on deck. The river flows south before turning out into the lake. The main river road on this island goes around in a circle. I would often stay on it, not wanting to cross the bridge home. Some roads tell us dead end, 
Others say, do not enter. The night my father died, I had to break three times to avoid hitting an animal crossing in front of me. One was an opossum, one was a deer. The third thing, I could not tell what it was. It happened that quick. No words. If I could get away with it, there'd be no words here at all. A feather or the entire wing of a bird whose beginning I know was in a nest in a tree I often stand beside with a hand reaching out to touch its bark. A leaf too, a part of a branch, both of which have fallen as if to give themselves to this poem. And fish, maybe just a few silvery scales that will shimmer luminescent when we raise the poem up to the day's failing light. And let us not forget the river itself, which cannot be held, which when we step into it, both of us are never the same. And what of the sun? What of the morning's dark? The moon that floats above us like a boat with no oars drifting through the night. Maybe the stars are actually fish or the lights of other boats or the blank pages of notebooks held up close to the candle's flame waiting to be burned or hoping to be made into poems or feathers or fathers or birds or trees, fish or river or darkness, the sun that will erase it all when there are no words, when there is nothing left to say, when no words can get it right. Here's another poem about um, going down and, and getting that glass of water. Um, which you'll kind of notice there's been at least a couple poems that sort of retell the same moment. Um, where there is a river, there is a light. When I went down to the river to draw a glass of water from it, I was really going to the river to let my father go, his spirit, to release him and it from a body that had already begun to go cold, turn stiff. So, so strange how the living become the dead so quick. When I walk back up from the river with the glass full of the river, the water glistened in the sunlight pouring in through the living room window with its view of the river, the steel mill looming silently on the river's other side. I dipped my fingers into it and touched my father on his head, his hands, his feet, his heart. Here I drew an invisible fish, a moon, a cross, a line to represent our beautiful river. There were loons out on the river that night, singing out across the darkness of the night after the two men drove up in their van to take my father's body away. I shaved him one last time before they wrapped him up. My mother happy to see his face so clean, it was almost shining. As if there was some light or lighthouse, at the very least a buoy blinking inside him, offering us a little hope to let those of us left alone on this river know which way was home. Couple more. 
what we can't get rid of. <clears throat> we cleaned out my father's shed today, my mother and me got rid of things we couldn't use, gave other stuff away, generator, snowblower, lawnmower, patched a hole in the roof where I noticed light was shining in. Where there's light, there is also rain. So much rain this spring, and now it's summer. Most days begin with the gray skin of clouds. I don't mind when it rains. I still like to take long walks down to Point Mouye with my dog. I'm sore this morning after a six mile hike out onto Lake Erie with its freighters filled with iron ore. On the tip of the point, I'm somewhere in between Toledo and Detroit. I know there are better places to be. I'm closer to Detroit, the city where my parents were born and raised, met in Del Rey's Southwestern High, dated, went steady, fell in love, married. The rest is history. Korean War, three kids, the midnight shift at Great Lakes Steel, a house on an island, sickness and death. Everything else is a love story that's not mine to tell. In my mother's words, I devoted my whole life to your father. He deserved it. The Song <clears throat> and the River. The days pile up one on top of the other until we are standing on top of a mountain looking out at a sky with no sun or moon. Not even the stars ask who we are. Even the sound of our own voice inside our head belongs to a stranger. When we try to remember or say our name, we are left with a silence. When you reach out for the wing of a passing blackbird, it turns away. Its black eye says to you, not yet. Below, there is a crack in the earth that turns out to be a river. Too deep to walk across and with a current too swift to swim, you wait to see if maybe a boat might take you. When no boat comes, you walk back home to the bed by the window with a view of the river. You climb back into the quiet. Across the river, the tallest point is a smokestack that no longer belches gray smoke. Beneath your bed pillow is a stone you placed in your pocket years ago during one of your many walks along the river. Stones are prayers, are songs only the birds can hear when they take us up on their backs to carry us home. Home, my father likes to say, I want to go home. You are home, I say. Maybe he sees the mountain and the blackbird. Maybe the stranger's voice is his own in the silence singing him home. This is gonna be the last poem. Briefly, it might have even flown. And it's the poem that closes out this book. We walk along the dirt and gravel dike that runs through the marsh with our dog moonshine between us. To our left, the lake stretching out for Ontario. Off to our right, the low water sloughs recently thawed. Two swans fly overhead with their long necks pointed toward Ohio. Later, we come upon a dead duck not yet eaten by a coyote. I turn it over with my boot and tow it down the bank where it lands with its face up to the sky. A fresh kill, I say. Something will come along and make use of it, I think. For now, it lives again here in this poem, 
a kind of preservation. Had I picked it up with my hands and thrown it briefly, it might have even flown. A momentary resurrection, power beyond our own. I think I'll end there. And then we can sort of uh, do whatever else you want to do with the remaining time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, wow. Um, you know, for anybody that's uh, gone through the grieving process, I mean, you recognize those moments <laughs> for sure in, the, in those poems. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions they want to um, make to Peter or anything at all? <clears throat> Jonathan, you. Yep, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it's kind of a spiritual question, but we can pretend it's a technical one and go in, <laughs> go into it that way. So, you know, for the most part, you're working in first person, but sometimes you work in third. Um, and then similarly, there's a lot of plain stuff that's held up, you know, held up to light, a lot of plain objects, a lot of plain, you know, experiences looked at almost like still life, right? Um, given the sort of reverence of attention. But then also there's this sort of elemental transformation, kind of mythological, a sort of mythological underworld going on at the same time. And so there's this like big spectrum, right? Between the sort of first person you know, kind of plain spoken with song, plain objects, way over here, this sort of mythological third person, otherworldly thing going on. And it, rem it reminds me, and this, this is every bit the compliment it's gonna sound like, um, Jack Gilbert's Great Fires came out when we were all in graduate school and we were all just knocked on our asses. I mean, we couldn't believe, I mean, it's what I think of as the most important book of poems about grief in the latter half of the 20th century. And, um, and your book really, really reminds me in that specific technical way of making use of that really broad spectrum of approaches to the material. Um, can you just talk about that? I mean, to, to, to what extent, you know, when you're, when you're working with this material that's so much bigger than your little small capacities of, of will, right? It's bigger than you. It's, you know, it's, it happened to you. Can you talk about using that really full wide spectrum? Probably not, Jonathan. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest, I mean, I, I think, I mean, there's so much in, in that observation and in that question about um, what I would hope that poetry can do. And I think certainly Jack Gilbert's The Great Fire is, is one of my totem books. It's one of those books that I mentioned uh, earlier in the reading that when I woke up and carried a stack of books over to the couch with me, um, The Great Fires was certainly among those, those books. Uh, for all those reasons where he's able to, uh, you know, sort of be addressing the, the bigger picture or the cosmos or the spiritual uh, and then to sort of turn back around and and face the, the the cruel reality that he faced of his beloved or one of his beloved wife's dying in the in the you know leaning against a chamber pot so to speak you know so those poems really impacted me when I was a young fiction writer, not even writing poems, but just as a reader and someone who I used to think I would never be able to deliver such purity, such honesty, such universality that is born out of the particular, the way that Gilbert does. Um, and, you know, and yet when my father became that person that I couldn't I couldn't look away from it or anything that I looked at just made me picture him. Um, it, 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 that's when I knew that I just had to uh, not only pay attention as like someone like Mary Oliver might tell us, but to, to be astonished by what I was seeing 
and to just really treat it with the reverence that, uh, you know, that I wanted or felt the need to do. If I was going to write about my father, um, even in this sort of compromised state that he was becoming, uh, I wanted to do something beautiful uh, or to sort of, you know, even though I'm not going to say it was a beautiful death, but through the way that I tried to ritualize um, even my acceptance of it and certainly the writing about it, um, I, I wanted these poems to be sung beautifully um, or to, um, you know, almost sort of elevate out of the elemental, which I think is the aim of, of any poem really. Um, so um, that's my response to uh, something that I don't think is even easy to talk about other than through the poem itself. Yeah. I've, I've come to believe with a lot of conviction that what makes the best art the best art is that it's useful that it's actually useful. And you oftentimes don't know how, you know, you look at a painting and then 10 years later you go, oh, I recognize that light. And I know the kind of grace of this moment, right? Um, but I, I found the book genuinely useful in that way that I think Gilbert was so useful to so many of us. And just, I, I think a lot of the best art is useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this, um more than anything, I mean, I, I typically write when, uh, when I write fiction, I write with no reader in mind. And what really changed in terms of my approach in this book was that I was really writing with thinking about a reader and someone, because I know that it's like, you know, it's, if we all live long enough, we're gonna suffer these kinds of losses. We're gonna lose our parents first, hopefully, and then you know, other loved ones. Um, and that really kind of made me feel that, okay, that maybe I'm not just messing around in the way that my other books are just me sort of just being playful or uh, you know, having fun with language. Like this really, I felt, after a while, I started, you know, again, with the encouragement of, of people like Russ, I just was like, okay, maybe these poems are saying something true and honest and what it means to be alive and what it means to die with, with meaning behind it, you know? And I think that my, that's one thing that uh, my father taught me as his sign of, sort of final lesson. I like the playfulness in, in the poems as well, though. I mean, how the, you're addressing the poem, you know, within the poem. <laughs> I mean, I love that because that's, that's so, you know, Raymond Quineau and, and, you know, the French uh, speaking of those things um, of grief, but also there's a certain like inner inner um, playfulness to it. I mean, not, not that they're not serious, but there, there's that ease of language, I guess, going on there, which I, when I heard you, you know, read No Words, for example, I mean, I was really taken with that poem, uh, reading in, in the car, like facing Lake Superior the, the one Sunday morning. And then, then hearing you read it was, wow, this is like a transcendent moment, Peter. It was a really very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Russ, for, for listening and, and reading the poems the way that they're intended. And yeah, I mean, it's true with, it, it was, it's hard for me to not just, let language be this medium that we manipulate and find pleasures in just the raw music of it. And I think that I'm probably guilty of that pleasure still at times in these poems, but really more than anything else, I was just trying to write really a non-literary book. You know, I just really was like, how can a book just sort of serve a purpose to regular people, you know, like, I live in a town with like regular people, the same way that I mean, we all live in these like regular places where not everyone's a writer, you know? Uh, and I was thinking like, these are people who I think that these poems might, you know, they might read them and say, hey, you know, like there's nothing all that 
challenging to these poems other than the fact that here's a poet who as much as he maybe wanted to look away from what he was looking at instead I looked closely at it and paid attention and uh, tried to, to, to speak about what I was seeing and hearing and feeling in a very authentic way and then to sort of offer it to other people. Um, so that accessibility that you mentioned, Jonathan, is really important to me um, in this book especially. So um, hope that came through. Um, I do have a question from somebody um, in chat because her mic isn't working, but um, she's wondering if these poems were written uh, throughout the years when your father was sick um, and in the hospital, or if all of the poems were written after he passed away. Yeah, um, Annie, there, there's a mixture. I mean, some of the poems were written while he was um, just, just sick in bed and sort of we were taking care of him. And then um, after he died, I kept on uh, writing them. So, and there, you know, the book itself probably has I don't know, maybe I should know this, maybe there's 80 poems in there or something like that. Um, but, you know, I mean, Russ saw many more poems than that. I mean, there's probably close to 250 versions of, of poems about this experience. Um, so I, you know, I couldn't shut it off once it, it, it did, uh, it, you know, once he did pass away. Um, and I just found that, you know, the material stayed very much alive. Um, so, and maybe me even writing about him and it was just a way to keep him very present uh, in my life because he was very present in my life. I, I just have one question. Uh, you know, at the beginning, I think of your reading, you said that, you know, these things were just coming out of you, you were writing them and um, when did, I mean, did you think that they were poems or did you have any idea of what, what you were, um, like, uh, what, what was coming out of you? You know, yeah. when did you decide they were poems? They sort of decided they were poems by themselves, you know, I mean, they, um, I never wrote them as anything other than words that found their form, uh, through breakage or, you know, through lines and things like that. So I knew I wasn't writing prose. I knew I wasn't writing fiction because I wouldn't have even considered trying to fictionalize uh, the subject matter. Um, and the thing is too, Martin, is that I was reading poems, right? So um, it was like these poems just sort of fed the conversation uh, that I felt like I was, um, waking up to uh, each morning as I was ritually um, at 5 a.m. And I really just it really enriched the experience of me being alive while sadly, tragically, my father was, you know, gradually, slowly um, dying. Um, but it just, um, you know, just it, it was a way for me again, just to sort of connect with with him um, to, uh, I don't know what the word is other than to just sort of to, to be uh, in the moment and in that space where I just felt like um, I was experiencing something brand new, you know, um, and, you know, with the exception of me losing some, you know, good buddies of mine that I grew up with over the years and my, my grandparents and things like this, this was the first death that I was very, you know, it was the heavy one, you know, like your father, it was just big. And I just, I knew it, you know, I just was, um, and I, after a while I was like, I knew that I was in the middle of something bigger than me even. And that's always a good feeling for, for you as a writer. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments for Peter? I just want to say, Marty, <clears throat> Marty, you're doing a really fantastic job in these readings, the series. I mean, um, and uh, thank you for all that. I mean, oh, well, you know, like I said, it's 
Um, I don't tell Peter uh, people at Peter White this, but I would, you know, I enjoy this so much I'd almost do it for free. But don't say that I said that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it really is such a joy to um, bring P to bring writers like P Peter to the library in this way. Um, it's just it's just amazing. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, it gives me it, it it gives me some confidence that I'm doing th something right anyway. <laughs> so, um, does anybody have any other questions? Oh. Annie has another comment here, just a second. Um, it says, um, I find it interesting you said that you were writing these poems to keep your father present since he was so present in your life, yet the poems are of sad memories of him on his deathbed. It would be hard to want to be present in moments of sadness. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think that there's something to be learned in those moments, you know, it just, I just it, it really taught me to be grateful you know I mean this wasn't a book of nostalgia even though there's some poems where I talk about um, you know sort of my my father growing up in Detroit and being you know a child of the depression like there's a couple little poems in the book that uh, sort of are are about that way of of, of telling that story mm -hmm. um, but you know I was the the moment of intensity uh or you know when do we get when do we wake up most you know mm. it's like when we're like forced to you know when uh we're sort of grabbed by the shirt collar and say you're kind of uh something insists or demands uh in us to to be present and to pay mm. attention um so uh i'm not making excuses i mean this book is 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 deliberately serious and deliberately heavy um as as i think loss and death and grief are you know i'm not trying to code it with anything other than the truth of the fact that you know life gets hard you know it gets mm -hmm. messy it's like you know you never imagine your father is gonna you know, need to be changed and, mm -hmm. you know, like cleaned up in the way that you do the way when you're a newborn or a new father and you're all of a sudden holding a, an infant that's doing all the same things that we do at our own ends and mm -hmm. making a mess of things. Um, so, I mean, there's joy in that. And I'm not going to say that there wasn't, um, I'm not going to use joy to describe that kind of caregiving but it certainly was important mm. you know and it had just the gravity of what it means to uh, serve somebody else you know and if you guys have ever had to take care of anybody else you know that uh, there's meaning in in that experience mm. so i think that's what what i was sort of um standing at attention to and, and sort of wanting to be there um, at the end, you know, mm. the same way that he was at, there for me at the beginning. Yeah, I, I was just uh, speaking with a friend of mine who just recently went through a loss and, and um, it struck me as I was listening to you, her comment was that um, people, uh, our culture doesn't know how to deal with grief um it doesn't it w w wants people to after the funeral is over and everything they want you to put it in a box and put it on a shelf and you know, like move on mm -hmm. as opposed to doing what you did which was really examine it and and really pay attention to it so yeah yeah thanks marty yeah there's one oh, other question from uh, oh. benjamin griffin oh sure hey, um sorry i didn't mean uh hit enter, but that's um, okay. <laughs> so I really love listening to your poetry and um, for changing the subject, what my first question was, what was your inspiration to make you want to publish your poetry? And my second question is, what are some um, advice that you will want to give to uh, new writers who want to publish their work? Yeah. 
I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that I always start any semester of teaching with is always those two words, pay attention, you know, make use of the things around you. If you're, if you're spending your time fishing, write about fishing, right? If you love to drive around in your car, write poems while, about driving around in your car. If you wanna write love poems to seduce your boyfriend or girlfriend, like, you know, like just do it, you know, but like pay attention to the specifics or the particulars of your experience. And out of those small little details, hopefully you'll write uh, a poem or whatever that speaks universally to people who have different particulars than your own. So paying attention is just, it's, it's central to what writers do. Um, even if you're a fiction writer and you're making things up, you're still having to pay attention to the small things that you're making up. So inspiration is just, you know, when you look in the mirror, be inspired by who you are and don't take for granted the fact that you're, you're somebody, you're from a place, right? And they're poem. I mean, all of my books take place in that little stretch of the river that I'm writing about. So like, you know, uh, you know, you find your landscape, find your language scape. What are some words that you just love, right? Um, begin there. If you find those words that you love, then everything you write is going to be a love poem or a love story. I hope that that comes through in, in this book in particular, but the couple of you who know my other books, you know, uh, even though they might not seem like love stories, they feel like love stories very much to me because I love words like mud and brother and river. So if I'm writing them into a sentence, I'm finding, I'm having a great time with it, right? Even if there's violence, even if there's disappointment, even if there's struggle, it's the love that really comes through. So be inspired by what you love. And in terms of advice for new writers and like, you know, what do you wanna publish? Publication is the least pleasurable part of the process, right? Cause there's only disappointment when a book comes out. And those of you who have books, I think you're gonna maybe agree with me in that it just, there's something final about it. Like I, I wish I didn't publish this book because then I'd still be writing more poems about that experience. But I sort of now had to put that away or turn that off. And for, for, for me as a writer, it's hard for me to shut down that language machine that brings me great pleasure. So I'll give you a little anecdote too, Benjamin. For about a decade of my life, I wrote these stories that ended up in a book called We Make Mud. Check it out. Um, but like, I felt like I could never write another story that didn't have these same characters running through it, right? So I tried to like shut them out and say, I'm not gonna write about them anymore. And I succeeded and I wrote a very short novel called Bob or Man on Boat. Right. And all of a sudden, about three quarters of the way through this book, these two brothers that I'd been writing for 10 years of my life showed up and like made a cameo in this book. So sometimes you can't even choose the things that you write about, especially if, if you work very obsessively uh, uh, the way that most writers do once they really get serious about uh, sitting down and doing the work of, of writing a book. Um, and that's just part of the, 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 the magic and the mystery and even that sort of the mythical element that I think uh, goes into the writing of, of books. Okay, thank you for the advice. Yeah, I don't know if it was very good advice, but it's <laughs> the only advice I can offer. Well, well, Lori agreed with you that the least uh, pleasurable part of it is the actual publication. So, yeah. <laughs> and um, Niles, who was here, just uh, wanted to uh, thank you for the reading. He had a, a really wonderful uh, time. He said he had to dig into a fish fry. All right, so. no, 
<laughs> love it. So anyway, um, I want to thank everybody uh, for showing up tonight. Um, this has been, like I said, well, it's always one of my favorite nights when I get to hear an author read their work and talk about their work. Um, upcoming in, in October, we have lots of poetry readings as part of the Big Read. And in November, we're also hosting virtually um, Joy Harjo on November 15th. So if you're a deer hunter, I apologize. That's the only day that Joy Harjo was available to give a reading. So Joy Harjo takes precedence over deer hunting um, in November. So, <laughs> but um, I really want to thank you, Peter, for, um, for the time that you spent and um, for your reading. And uh, um, we do have a copy of Peter's book at Peter White Public Library, but I'm going to go in and I'm going to tell um, the person who does the book ordering that they need to get a couple more copies of the book for our shelves. So anyway. Um, thank you. And thanks for everybody whose uh, name I'm looking at or face or picture. I really appreciate you guys listening and uh, being being present here tonight to uh, be a part of this. This is sort of my first official reading for this book, and uh, it wasn't easy. I'll just say that. Yeah, and and we we just really appreciate. Um, I I know I appreciated those poems um, in a very uh, very significant and personal way. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, guys. All right, everybody have a great night and um, come back again to Peter White when we have another uh, author reading. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Jonathan, good to see you. Thanks, Pete. We'll see you soon. Yeah, Jonathan. We'll see you out in Spokane, eh? Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> Whenever you can make that happen, let's do it. Yeah, we should talk about whether we want to do it. In the fall. I want to do it when it's pretty enough to get in the mountains. So we can either do it in the fall before it gets cold or we can do it in the spring when it's nice again but we'll talk yeah i'll defer to you on that either either one works for me i you know want to just spend time with you and amy and uh see the mountains and that would be awesome yeah well it's all it's all set we just have to pick a date yeah so, all right uh, let's do it all right John. Cool. all right thanks all for right. being here good to thanks, see you guys thanks, we'll Martin. see you later yeah see no you. problem all right all right, good night, everyone. Good night. Night.